Manisha. Ni hao ma? That's the way we say how are you in Mandarin. That is the official Chinese dialect. Today, we're all going to get Shanghai. We're going to be taken to a visit to that mysterious city and sample the whole sweet and sour fish, pineapple, honey, ham, and sweet day filled crepes. Here, I want to start the first wonderful dish. The reason why this is so wonderful is because fish is healthy, it's low calorie, and it's wonderfully delicious. And a lot of you worry about weight. Fish is wonderful to try. How many of you love fish? Raise your hand. Oh, practically everybody, all of everybody. I love fish, but I also love other type of meat. So the great thing about fish is give the balance of diet. Here, I'm going to show you, we started out with one whole fish. This is a rock cut. You can use red snapper. You can use brown snapper. This happened to be brown. It's not red. So you can use a lot rock cut. This is approximately one and a half to two pounds. Okay. And also, I have shredded about half of a carrot, julian shred, matchstick shred, and also green onion, one whole green onion. You can use two or you can use three, nobody cares. And then also <laughs> use a tiny bit, that is true. And also use a tiny bit of, this is bamboo shoot, okay? And also julian green pepper, you can use red pepper, and also mushroom. We call shiitake mushroom or donggu and also two egg bitten. And also approximately one cup or half a cup of flour. You can use cornstarch, you can use flour, okay? Start, now how can you tell a fish is nice and fresh? Because a lot of people, when they go out, they can't tell. First of all, when you smell it, it does not have that overwhelming sting. <laughs> Besides, you look at the eye. Look at a riot eye and say, how about it? <laughs> because it, not, it should be clear. It should not be opaque. And also, you open this and check the gill. The gill should be pinkish red. It should not be dark. If it's dark, it has been in the fish store since 1946. <laughs> now, I show you. I have one here. <laughs> that in my closet <laughs> since the 1645. <laughs> you definitely don't want to hold on to something like this and try to cook a Shanghai whole sweet and sour fish because you drive all your gears away. <laughs> this is actually salted fish. Now, step number one. Now also, you should kind of press the meat and make sure the Scales are firm. If the scales is mushy, that means the fish is not too fresh. So look at all these elements, okay? Now, step number one. Because this particular dish, I want to defy in such a way that it will sit there. It will not suck, stand, or fall sideways. Step number one. I have a little cut right here, okay? Secondly, I have a little cut right here. Okay, cut it right in the middle. So when I put this, it will open up like this, look. It's just like the darn thing is looking right at you. <laughs> Stay. Now, when this is done, I am gonna use this is a serious fishy business. <laughs> when this is done, I am going to show you, you can score the fish. Now, you can score it, the reason why scoring the fish. One, two, three, and turn it to the other side. One, two, three. When you score the fish, it 
serve a number of purposes. One, the seasoning can get through the fish. Secondly, it doesn't take too long to cook because the heat can penetrate close to the bone, so it can have more uniform cooking. Okay, and the next thing is, I am going to slightly coat this with egg, beaten egg. Okay, you have to beat this up a little bit. Put this around, put this around, put this around, and then also sprinkle some cornstarch or flour. Sprinkle, sprinkle. Put it inside here too. It's a messy, it's a messy, fishy job. <laughs> you should do it at home. Close the kitchen door. Don't let anybody know what's going on. <laughs> And then, after that, let me show you. Let me clean up my hand. In the meantime, this is a gigantic fish, so I use a gigantic wok. For small baby fish, you use a baby wok. <laughs> now when you put it in, there's a little trick here, okay? When you put it in, you put it in like this. Hold on to it. Something is moving. <laughs> Swim away. <laughs> you hold on to it, you can walk around, no problem. <laughs> have a good time. Cooking should be fun. Now, if you have a gigantic fish, you use a gigantic strainer. <laughs> and you can even ladle this. Wow, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at how, when it's done, it looks at how, how it looks. Look at this. You should cook it for approximately Now, in the meantime, we are going to have a little pot here and use approximately two teaspoons of oil to make this a nice sweet and sour sauce. Now, you can have this all sweet or you can have all sour. The trick is to make it just sweet and sour. Not too much sweet, not too much sour. Put this here. Oh, bring it to a quick boil. And also, let's come back here and put all these ingredients right in here. If you notice that, why I'm boiling this, I can also go back there and do one more thing. <laughs> if you notice that, this is a big fish. That's why I use a little bit more oil. In fact, there are more oil here than the old pack, except this is much cheaper. The problem is, you can only use these in your kitchen and not in your car. <laughs> now, let us do this when it's done. Let me show you how simple it is. We're going to put this dish here and bring this to a boil and thicken this up a little bit. And then you pull the whole thing. Right on the fish. This is how beautiful this. Why I'm pulling this? Frida, over there, have a question for us. Yes, I do. Since beautiful. my husband's Look. become diabetic, I have problems preparing sweet and sour dishes, which we both like. What would you suggest we use as a substitute for sugar? First of all, if you cannot take sweet and sour dish, all you have to do is take him to Italian restaurant. <laughs> or, or better yet, develop a lot of dishes called sour and sour dish. <laughs> so once you develop that taste, you have no problem. You don't have to worry about sweet anymore. Now basically, what I would suggest is either use sugar substitute or try to develop dishes that use natural ingredient to give that sweetness and you know, cut down on it, because not every single dish has to be sweet and sour. It's ridiculous. So, but 
I do want to answer somebody else's question that mentioned to me, how do you make an average common sweet and sour sauce, just like the one I just did, it's very easy. Normally you use one portion of rice vinegar or regular apple cider vinegar to one portion of sugar. And then you use about a little bit more, about one portion to one and a quarter portion of water. Just mix them all up. If you want, you can also put ketchup. Normally I don't like to use hot and sour type of thing, but if you want, you can put a tiny bit of chili. Some sweet and sour sauce have a lot, little bit of chili. And of course, sometimes you see bloody red sweet and sour sauce because they add a tiny bit of red food coloring. Normally I just add ketchup, okay? Thank you. My pleasure. Now, this dish is called pineapple honey ham. Very simple to do. It's a wonderful dish to serve to your honored guests. You start it out with approximately one and a half pounds of Virginia ham. This is a ham from Virginia, not Pocatello, Idaho. <laughs> and also, we use approximately half a cup of lotus seed. Okay, this is lotus seed. This one with skin, this one with no skin. You can tell the difference. And also use half a can of about eight ounce can of pineapple ring. And also use approximately two tablespoons of dry sherry, one tablespoon of honey, and about half a teaspoon of soy sauce, and a tiny bit of sugar or rock sugar. This is rock sugar I want to introduce. If you want to make this dish exotic, I'm going to show you what do you mean by rock sugar. This is how. <laughs> wow! This can be dangerous. Now, all you really want to do is start with slicing these Virginia ham. Cut it up, thin slices like this, and you put it here. And you cut it, and you put it here. Okay? And then after you do that, after you slice them all up, I want to show you, I am going to lay this up like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> when you put them all together, you can put these mixture of honey, soy sauce, right here. Okay, wow. And also, rock sugar or regular sugar, put it here. And you are going to steam it. And after you steam it, you can invert it out. And then you can garnish it with, let's put this in. Because we've got so many people here. Everything we cook, we have to double the recipe. See, now you're looking at television set. You can see what's <laughs> happening right there. In the meantime, I'm gonna cook this lotus seed. Most of these are either from China or from Hawaii. If you visit Hawaii, you can see a lot of these. Now, I cook this in a syrup. I wanna show you. Right here, I cook this in a syrup, okay? Right now, you gotta steam it over medium low heat for approximately half an hour to 45 minutes, medium to medium low heat. And in the meantime, notice that I want to show you, this is how it would look. Isn't that beautiful? Now, you might notice I have some garnish with pineapple and cucumber. I want to show you how easy it is to garnish with cucumber. You s cut a little piece of cucumber, you make little slices like this, okay? Thin slices like this, okay? And then you can tell, can you see that? You can make it into a fan like this. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and then you can put every other one like this. Every other one, can you see that? Every other one. Then you end up having something like this. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> Everybody can do it. I learned this 25 years ago. I haven't <laughs> forgot. So you can garnish it, so it's very easy to do. Now, why we are doing all these? I understand. We have a question over there. 
Martin, can you tell us a way to preserve ginger and how long it might be kept? First of all, when you go out to the store, when you buy ginger, don't buy too big a piece. Because if you buy too big a piece, it lasts you two and a half centuries. <laughs> you buy a piece just enough to last for about a week or so, okay? The best way to store the ginger is peel it and slice it up and you put it in dry sherry in an airtight container in the fridge. It will last you for a while. Another way is peel it and mince it up or julienne it and put it in oil because when you cook, you can scoop out the oil and the ginger simultaneously. That's another way to do it, okay? I understand that Jack over there also have a question for us. What is the best way to prepare dried whole anchovies? Well, I'm quite sure you know that anchovy is very aromatic, pungent, and very, very tasty. It got a nice aromatic flavor. So the best thing is to use it for steaming. In Chinese style, you use it for steaming because you can use it as a flavoring agent, or you can put it in salad. You can do it any way you want. A lot of the time, they also use it in stew dishes to just to give that nice touch of exotic aroma because they're all different kinds of anchovies. Some are very strong, some are mild, some are tasteless. <laughs> and you want the good ones, they give that nice exotic touch to your dish. So you can do it any way you want. Just use it in different ways. Now, thank you for a wonderful question. <laughs> now, I thought that since Jock asked a very interesting exotic question. So we're going to introduce you some exotic ingredients in Chinese cooking. First, I want to introduce you to something that Chinese love dearly. It's the shark's fin. This little thing cost me $27. They're anywhere from $25 to approximately $175 a pound, depends on quality, OK? And besides, when you clean this up, only about one half of this can be used. This is preserved duck egg, okay? This is wonderful for appetizer. It goes, after you break this up, it looks like this. The egg, the egg white is denatured to a dark brown color. And the egg yolk is developed into unbelievably ugly color. <laughs> and it's very strong aromatic. It smells like ammonia. But people love it. But people love it because it's so exotic. You can put this and serve with pickled ginger. Wonderful appetizer, classic. Here, we have salted duck egg. You put this ash with a tiny bit of salt. So it will denature the egg white into a more watery consistency. And then the egg yolk solidify into a little thing, like a Chinese a red ping pong ball. <laughs> And here, we have the expensive hei seaweed that I mentioned earlier. This in Chinese called fat choy. This any, costs anywhere from $50 to $125 a pound. That's why I always lock this up in my safe. <laughs> this one is one of the most exotic things. They call sea cucumber. Very, this is dehydrated. Ah, oh, you can make music out of these. This, you have to soak this for about three days. <laughs> and then you cut it up and it's absolutely tasteless. <laughs> but it got a nice, wonderful texture. You put it in stir-fried dishes, in vegetarian dishes, and you put it in soup. Wonderful. And this is a dry red day. You soak this and you de it. You can use this to make our next dish called Sweet day fuel, crepe. We're going to show you how to do it right over here. Now, this particular red day, the Chinese use it for a lot of things. One of the things they use is they put it in that one that I just did, the egg treasure rice. You see, used as a garnish. And also, you can put it in dessert. You can do anything. This particular dish I'm going to show you is called sweet day fill cream. You will start with one cup of flour mixed with one egg and also one cup of water. 
okay? And I also use the day, sweet pitted day that you can find in any supermarket. And also to make it even more exotic, I have a tiny bit of chopped peanut. You can use peanut, you can use cashew nut, you can use walnut, you can use mixed nut, you can use any nut you can find. A lot of them in Golden Gate Park or Central Park. <laughs> Now, the first thing I would want to do is make that nice crepe, okay? Very easy to do. Let me show you how to make this crepe. You heat up a little pan. Use, use non-stick frying pan, it's much easier to do. Okay, use a tiny bit of oil, not much. Swirl this around. Swirl this around. Hot, hot! Okay? And then you use these to put it here. This particular dish is for the romantic people because it has many days. <laughs> you win some and you lose some. I'll try better next time. You make a little crepe like this. Do not make it too big. Do not make it too big. Move them around. Move them around. I recommend all of you use a non-stick frying pan to do it so you won't get stuck. I'm not quite sure how many of you remember or know that the Chinese invented pasta, but the Italian make them very famous. The same thing, the Chinese invented crepe. Okay? But the French make it famous. Because in China, they don't call it crepe, they call it thin pancake. That's the reason why the Chinese never get any credit out of it. Huh? Wonderful. You toss it, huh? Wonderful. Huh? We can make a lot of pancake. And I want to show you, after you make the pancake, you roll it up first, okay? Let's roll this up and set it aside. And I put it here, and I want to show you how you can fill this date. Fill, creep. You have gigantic one here. You can have medium gigantic one here. Or you have smaller gigantic one here. It doesn't matter how big you want to make it, OK? Now I use a little knife, and I put in about one tablespoon of these right here, put in one tablespoon. Now, it depends on how sweet you want it to be. Sometimes you want it really sweet, you add some more sugar in the sweet pitted day that you find in supermarket. Sprinkle, how many of you like peanut? Everybody? Oh, everybody, including myself. And then you hold it, you fold it like this, one, Two, just like you fold an envelope. You fold it, and you fold it, and you hold on to this, and don't let it go, and it go look like this, okay? And after you finish, you put them all and brown it with a tiny bit of oil. Not much, just sprinkle. Any polyunsaturated oil would do. You don't have to use peanut oil. You can use any oil. Do it very, very carefully, like this. Put it right here, like that, see? Right here. This is a wonderful dessert, and I recommend all of you go home and try it. You gotta brown it until they're nice and brown. After this is brown. You see, move them around, don't let it get stuck. <laughs> and then you cut it up into three pieces. It looks like this. And you put it here, you stack them all up. It's very easy to do. Now basically, when you do the red date paste, all you have to do is start with this type, type of sweeted, peated date that you can find and put in a food processor. Make it into a paste. That's very simple. Cut it up, cut it up, stack them all up, stack them all up, stack them all up, and you serve to your guests. Remember, if Yen can cook, so can you. Join in. Hey.